In 1995, an event took place which changed gaming forever. It changed how we thought about games, about what games could be and could do, even about who games were for. It perhaps single-handedly changed the gaming landscape, paving the way for the gaming industry to become the behemoth it is today. That's right, in 1995, Street Fighter the movie was released for home distribution. Also the PlayStation came out. The PlayStation might have revolutionized video games, but savvy board gamers knew where the real innovation was. You could keep your Tomb Raiders and your Final Fantasy VII's with their cinematic scope and ambition, your Resident Evil's with their genuinely claustrophobic sense of terror, Metal Gear Solid, no thank you said the board gamers, I'll take wood for brick. Does anybody need brick? So in this video, we're going to talk about how Catan did for board games, what the PlayStation did for video games. In particular, we're going to talk about how Catan did it by looking at Monopoly and thinking, hmm, I could fix that. But first, the suggestion that Catan fixed Monopoly needs some qualification. To understand that something needs to be fixed, you first need to understand that it has problems. Something that might not be immediately apparent if you've never played a modern board game like Catan. After all, you might reasonably suggest, what else can you do with board games? What can you do with dice and tokens and cardboard that hasn't already been done? So you can't do any of those things, but it turns out there are a lot of other things that you can do with board game components. And that's not even mentioning any board game's most important component, the people playing the game. Turns out there are a lot of things that you can do with people. Really can't do that. But for all of this to make sense, we need to take a step back and talk about what Monopoly is as opposed to what we think Monopoly is. Monopoly began life in 1903 when Elizabeth McGee, a progressive left-wing feminist and follower of Henry George, patented The Landlord's Game. The Landlord's Game was less of a game and more critique on the idea of capitalism, particularly the idea of private land ownership. Interestingly, McGee cemented the idea by creating two versions of the rules. An anti-capitalist version in which players were rewarded for creating wealth, and a capitalist version which shares more in common with a certain board game you might have heard of. The idea was that playing both versions of the game would lead you to conclude that the capitalist model was bull over the next 30 years, the Landlord's Game would gain traction in left-wing circles and among college students, as you might expect, but it also found its way to the likes of Charles Todd, a Philadelphia businessman. Todd, in turn, introduced it to his friend Charles Darrow during a dinner party. Charles Darrow, if you've heard the name at all, is the name you associate with the designer of Monopoly. As Darrow liked to tell it, the idea for Monopoly came to him in a flash of inspiration. He sold the idea to Parker Brothers in 1932. The rest, as they say, is history. Except it's not. If you hadn't already guessed, what Darrow actually sold was Lizzie McGee's The Landlord's Game, repackaged, redesigned, and without the anti-capitalist rules. For her trouble, McGee was paid $500 by Parker Brothers for the patent, received no royalties, and suffered the indignity both of seeing her game misrepresented and seeing Charles Darrow credited as sole designer. She would actually spend more than $500 fighting an ultimately futile court case against Parker Brothers. Darrow, meanwhile, made millions. So Monopoly is based on something that was never intended to be fair or balanced or even really a game as we understand it, rather it was an educational tool designed to teach its players a harsh lesson. It's a lesson you're still subject to if you play Monopoly today. 
You're subject to it if you spend a disproportionate amount of time in jail while other players buy all of the property. You're subject to it when you roll the one number that lands you on another player's expensive hotel, bankrupting you through no fault of your own. These are all things that were present in Lizzie McGee's original design. And in that sense, they work, they serve their purpose, they make their point. They're perhaps less successful as components of a fair and balanced experience as a vehicle for having fun with family and friends, which at any rate is probably how German designer Klaus Tuber felt about it when he designed and released Settlers of Catan in 1995. Settlers of Catan, later rebranded Catan as if it were some sort of celebrity diva, isn't much to look at. It's a bit bland, a bit boring. It's certainly not sexy the way the PlayStation is sexy. But the aesthetics aren't really the point. The point is what's inside the box and what it does. On a fundamental level, that really does just mean Monopoly, but on an island. And this is it, the island of Catan, which in the fiction of the game, you and your friends have innocently stumbled upon. And just like real historical examples of people innocently stumbling upon places, you're immediately going to start building stuff all over it in order to claim it for yourself. So you're not buying existing property like streets or railways or utilities, rather you're building settlements, roads and cities in order to claim the best and most valuable land. But value in Catan is not measured by money, in fact there's no currency in the game. Rather it's measured by five resources. By building settlements on this island you'll be able to collect and trade resources in order to build even more settlements, ultimately I guess proving that you're the best at settling? So at this point you might be thinking, okay it really is just Monopoly but on an island, so what big deal? Well. Let's look at those problems, and in particular how Catan took each of those problems and updated them. Player agency refers to the influence a player has over the game. It's not just the choices and decisions you make, it's how impactful and meaningful those choices and decisions are. Without player agency, you're not so much playing a game as doing what the game tells you when the game tells you to do it. A classic example of a game with no player agency is Snakes and Ladders. Snakes and Ladders was originally called Moksha Patam, and it came out of India around the same time as other classic board games like Ludo and Parcheesi. Similar to Monopoly, Snakes and Ladders was designed more as an educational tool than it was a game, although Snakes and Ladders was designed to teach its players more about Hindu philosophy than it was to teach its players about how bad capitalism is. If player movement in your game is determined by the role of the dice, then you're restricting the agency your players have. You're restricting their ability to make their own decisions. If I want the last green property, I need to land on it to buy it. But landing on it is not my decision. Yeah, well, at least I'm not going to jail this turn. Oh, for f Catan looked at this and thought, how can we give players more agency? The conclusion was pretty simple. Catan removed the track around the board which you follow, it removed the pieces which represent the players. Instead, Catan gives each player two settlements and two roads at the beginning of the game, with which those players can, within reason, build wherever they would like. The implication is pretty clear. By allowing players the freedom to choose where to start and where to build, players have much more control over how they play the game. Some people would argue that Monopoly players have more agency than I'm giving the game credit for, and they would say so with some justification. After all, the odds are against me landing on the property I want to buy, but conversely the odds are good that somebody will land on it and buy it. Somebody I could negotiate with. But in practice, it often isn't that simple. 
Monopoly describes itself as the fast dealing property trading game, which isn't exactly accurate. While it is possible to make deals in Monopoly, a lot of the time it makes more sense not to. And that's simply because you can't control the consequences of any deal you make. If you trade this final green property to me, you can't subsequently decide to avoid green properties once houses and hotels appear on them. So you might reasonably withhold that card. And out of petty retribution, I might decide to withhold something you really want, leading to the sort of stalemate that can drag games out. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what I do if you decide not to give me this card. I can get down on my knees and beg you. I can lie prostrate at your feet. I can offer up my most valuable possessions. But if you decide I'm not going to get this property, I'm not going to get this property. Catan makes trade not just a central part of the game, but makes it unavoidable. Sometimes you have no choice but to trade. So each turn in Catan you roll the dice, and any tile with the same number pays resources to anybody who has an adjacent settlement. Let's say I want to build a settlement next to a forest because that will allow me to start collecting wood. But you need wood up front in order to make a settlement, and I don't have any wood. This might strike you as something of a problem. In Catan, the only solution is to approach another player and make them an offer. Not that kind of offer. Maybe. So I approach the red player because the red player already has a settlement next to two forests and is already producing wood. They tell me that they need wool, and it just so happens that I have a settlement next to a field and I already have some wool. So in Catan, this is an easy and obvious trade. I'll give the red player some of my wool. In return, I'll take some of the red player's wood. Everybody gets something they need. Everybody leaves happy. Catan has a couple of other tricks which makes trading relatively frictionless and smooth, not least in the way it keeps players' collected resources secret. So although you can sometimes guess what players have, what they might want and what they're going to do, you can't always be sure. In that situation, withholding resources doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when Catan offers players ways of actually stealing goods from other players. So most of the time it makes sense to be open and approachable to trading, to make allies and partners out of your opponents and not make yourself into a target. There is one problem with Monopoly that pretty much everybody can agree with, and that's that the game takes too long to play, sometimes stretching on for entire nights. That's not really a surprise when you think about it. The game doesn't end until all but one player have been bankrupted, which means that a sizable amount of the property and money in the game needs to go to one player for it to end. It's such a problem that even Hasbro, the game's publishers, have admitted it, publishing a set of speed play rules which limit the play time to roughly 60 to 90 minutes. It's on the back of the rulebook for my edition of Monopoly, it's probably on the back of the rulebook for your edition of Monopoly, but let's be honest, you wouldn't know because you've never read the rules. But playing Monopoly this way feels cheap, it feels against the spirit of the game, whether that spirit is intentional or not. It's not against the spirit of the game in Catan, which sets a hard limit on the amount of time you play. It does this using victory points, with the player who wins being the first to reach 10. Each settlement you have is worth a victory point. If you upgrade those settlements to cities, they're worth two. You'll get more points for having the longest road network, even for building special developments like markets and libraries. The point here is that unlike Monopoly in which you're trying to outlast your opponents, Catan is a race. And in that respect, it never outstays its welcome. All of this contributes and leads to Catan's biggest innovation, which is related to player interaction. In Monopoly, other players' turns tend not to be very interesting for you. In a five or six player game, this means you're spending quite a lot of time waiting to just play the game. A problem that's exacerbated if your turns aren't particularly interesting. Nope. 
Conversely, in Catan, everybody's turn is interesting to everybody. Because you roll the dice each turn, there's always a chance you might collect resources. And because you're constantly trading, you're always engaged and involved and talking to other players. Now I say this is Catan's biggest innovation, and that's because it led to a philosophy that underpins game design today, namely that the most important components of any game are the people playing it. Catan was released 25 years ago, and its influence can still be felt today. Alongside the PlayStation, it not only changed gaming, it changed how we related to gaming and how we thought about what games could be. Its influence is so far reaching that much of the philosophy and principles that guide modern game design can be traced directly or indirectly back to it. But just like the PlayStation, Catan has inevitably been superseded, and to such a degree that among some more serious board gamers, it's come to be seen as an antique, a relic, in some circles even a joke. But that's to miss what Catan is and what it does. Unlike the PlayStation, Catan has not been relegated to the realm of nostalgia. Not only has it sold millions of copies, it continues to be one of the best selling and most popular board games today. New players are continually being introduced to a way of thinking about and playing board games that perhaps they wouldn't have been introduced to without it. So ultimately, perhaps this is really how Catan fixed Monopoly. And coming into this project, that was my conclusion. But there is a little bit more to be said. So Catan is undoubtedly a better game than Monopoly, but in updating and modernising Monopoly, Catan actually lost something. Whether or not Charles Darrow intended it, and we can assume from his shameless opportunistic cash grab that he did not, the message at the heart of Lizzie McGee's The Landlord's Game is still present in Monopoly as we play it today. But Catan, in updating and modernising Monopoly, actually lost that message. So in a world in which wealth inequality is growing, and in which the people who have the money and the power are continuing to get more money and power, and the people with very little are losing even more, perhaps there's an opportunity here to reclaim Monopoly, to make it relevant in the way that Lizzie McGee intended. So we're not talking about controversy baiting editions like the one in which socialism is bad, or the one in which we make fun of millennials not being able to buy anything, or even the one in which we pretend that equal rights exist for women. What I'm talking about is returning Monopoly to Lizzie McGee and playing the game in the spirit in which she intended. Because frankly, Charles Darrow. Thank mm -hmm. you.